Let's go to the Lord in prayer. O oh Lord our God, even as we sung this precious psalm, some of us remembered the days in which we were quite wicked before God, apart from Christ, prideful and lifted up in our own conceit, not having a thought of God, or if our thought of God was there, it was blasphemous. We were despisers of God and even haters of men made in the image of God. But then the loving kindness of the Lord appeared to us and turned our hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. And we cried out to the living God to save us. And thou hast saved us so greatly. And so, Father, many of us come into the house of God this day, even with great regrets over how wicked we have been in our life, how we have wasted away our years. We have had our life uh, not devoted to the service of the living God, and instead we have served idols, uh, things that were as dung as the apostle himself remembered of his own life. And so as we remember those things, Father, we come into worship now at times with a sense of regret and uh, despondency, perhaps. Or maybe even this week was not a week that was set apart for the glory of God, and it was one that was set in pursuit of the world, and we have come to be convicted of these things, and uh, we mourn. And so, Father, we pray as we come to worship that Thou wouldst convict us of these things, yes, but also as we turn unto the Lord, that even now, this hour, thou wouldst replace the heaviness that we feel with the garments of praise, and that thou wouldst make us fruitful as we hear the word of God preached unto us, that we would resolve to live for the Lord. We would put away those things that were behind us and reach forth unto Christ who is before us. And so we ask, Lord, then that there would be a great blessing sent from the heavens as we Open the word of God that the years the locusts have chewed away would be restored and replaced with great fruitfulness. May it begin by the word sent into our hearts and minds. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, please turn, if you would, in your copy of God's word to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. We'll begin reading in verse 12. Our focus is verse 25. And as you turn there and find your place... Uh, we're taking a break from our series on Christian liberty briefly. As you know, as we often have doctrinal series, we try to break that up with other texts so that we're not mired into one subject for too long, uh, but we may hear more of the counsel of God. And um, as you turn to Joel chapter 2, verse 12, what has just preceded earlier in the chapter, we won't read it, uh, Joel prophesied of a mighty army that would come as locusts uh, upon Judah. Some of that is connected to chapter 1, of course. But that's where we pick up the reading where we have God proclaiming that doom is coming. Um, and so he gives us the prescription starting in verse 12. Let us hear the word of the living God as he speaks to us now. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? 
Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part towards the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And this specifically is our verse that I'll preach on. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Amen. May God bless his word to us. Let's pray for the preaching. O Lord, our God, we come to the preached word and we ask that uh, as the spirit was promised in this text to be poured out, that he would be poured out amongst us now. That the same spirit that was poured out at Pentecost, that led thousands to Christ, would also be here in the preaching of the word. So pour out your spirit upon your minister that he may preach in such a way as Christ himself preached in the synagogue that would comfort the afflicted. And we pray that those afflicted among us here would hear this word from the Lord. They would turn from their sin and they would turn unto the Lord their God and that any here who are unconverted through the preaching of the word that they would hear the word that says, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved and delivered. O Lord, do these things for the glory of God. And so we pray that thou wouldst give thy servant the tongue of the learned, that by Christ's spirit I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. And we ask these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, sin is a devourer. Sin is a devourer. As a swarm of locusts devours a land, it devours and it ravages the years that we have to serve the Lord. As we've been considering Wednesday nights in our series on the prodigal son, it leaves us, doesn't it? Sin leaves us perishing. It delights in our death. It is a devourer of both our soul and of our body. There is a great and terrible loss in our lives that comes from a lifetime of sin or even seasons of it. You know, that's what we often miss, don't we, when we toy with sin. The great loss that comes to us for entertaining it. We don't think of sin in that way. Sometimes we think of it merely as judicial, don't we? That all it is is really a trespass against Ten Commandments. Well, first and foremost, it is against God 
It strikes at his honor and his glory. But as it far as its effect in us, it devours. It decimates. It leaves us desolate. And when the Holy Spirit awakens our soul to the reality of it, and I trust many of you know this, regret comes. We grieve what sin has done in our life. And we think and we say, what have I done, O Lord? What has sin done to me? Look at the utter waste that my life has been or seasons of my life have been. Time meant to be redeemed to the glory of God, but now years wasted away, useless, it seems, uh, useless by my sin or perhaps even the sin of another that has affected my life so greatly. And, and we can start to lose hopefulness and we can stop being useful in the kingdom of God. We can stop walking with the Lord. We can stop making forward progress in our life with God in the Christian life. And it keeps us from being fruit. These thoughts, right? They keep us from being fruitful and constant with the Lord as we're uh, mired in, in things that we have done and have repented of and have sought new obedience over by the grace of God. This is a, a problem for many in the church who are spiritually sensitive. It really is. They live with a kind of regret and then they become useless today based on their uselessness yesterday. And so today, tonight, what I want to do is tie two threads. And this is why this text was on my heart, just because not only have we been reading through the minor prophets and texts like this stick out, but also as I was thinking about the theme of hopefulness and hopelessness in Psalm 119, last Lord's Day morning, verses 25 to 32, as well as restoration of the prodigal son on Wednesday nights, and we think of his season of sin and how he came back totally empty, half dead. Both of those themes meet here in Joel 2.25 when the Lord proclaims, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. What a great and tremendous promise this is. You know, the child of God with hope in the Lord and the knowledge of the scriptures says as with Job, right, as we consider Job, that the latter days may be more fruitful than the former days. That is what the child of God must constantly remember in their life. That as far as they have gone, and maybe it has been decades of sin, he can bless what is remaining in my life with more fruitfulness than sin could actually have taken away. Just as he did with Abram, Moses, Sarah, Manasseh, and Paul, saints who had spent decades apart from the Lord, and yet their latter end was incredibly and extraordinarily fruitful. As terrible as sin has been to strip away my years, Jesus Christ is far greater to restore. It does not matter, the saint then says, if I am 80 years old and just now repented and was born again this very day, in just a week of my life, the God who created all things in the space of six days can make the remnant of my life, even if it is just a week left, far more fruitful than what sin had robbed in 80 years. That is the reality of the gospel and that is the power and grace of God. And the child of God is never to forget it. And so with that then, our theme is this, Christ restoring the years that sin had stolen away. Christ restoring the years that sin had stolen away. And we'll divide our sermon into two heads. First, ruin and repentance. And second, restoration and rejoicing. So first, ruin and repentance. Now some context for the book of Joel. I know we've read through it uh, in our readings, but uh, some context might he help make sense of where we are in our text. And you could probably begin with the name of our prophet, which is Joel. That's a compound name. It comes from Jehovah and God, El, right? The meaning is plain. It's Jehovah is God. That is the meaning of Joel's name. And that's quite fitting, you think, for a prophet of God who is proclaiming that Jehovah is God and there is none other. It's a fitting name that God has given to this prophet. Jehovah is God. Now, we're not precisely sure of the dates 
of his ministry. They're not laid out so obviously in the text. However, many think that he prophesied before an invasion of the Assyrians by King Sennach- uh, by Sennacherib. Rather. In any case, for our theme, we merely need to consider the state of Judah at the time that Joel prophesied, because that is very plain in itself. Now in chapter 1, and you're likely familiar with this in the fourth verse, uh, locusts had utterly devoured the land and brought famine. Uh, a total famine, total stripping bare of all the livelihood of, his, of Judah. You know, the memorable verse in verse 4, chapter 1, what our verse 25 hearkens back to, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left the caterpillar eaten. Now, there are some theories here on what these particular insects and worms are. Some believe it's the life cycle of the locust, and some believe that they're differing species. And I think we could get bogged down in that today, and uh, I don't think that's where the Lord would have us put our energies. Let's put that aside for a moment. The point is really this, that there is a total destruction and devastation of Judah's crops. And it's come from wave after wave of these insects. And it was a desolation that had never been seen before. And as we think about our theme of fruitfulness, now think about what that meant for the labors of the people of God. You think of them as an agricultural society, right? Years of fruitfulness taken away from them by these swarms and these hordes. Maybe there was a lifetime, and some of you are um, involved in agriculture, maybe a lifetime of careful labor and planning and plowing and uh, and sowing, right, And, and reaping. All of it had been erased by this devastation. You know, in chapter 1, Joel preached to the old men, asking them, has such a thing been seen before? Nothing like this had ever been seen before in Judah. The ancients, right, he's asking the old men, he said, as long as you've been alive, and maybe you know then from your parents' time before you, has anything like this been seen in Judah? In other words, this is not some cyclical locust swarm. This was a total devastation of Judah that had never been seen before. And Joel said in chapter 1, tell your grandchildren about it. Tell the generations to come about this. But even that was not the end. He said, this is just a precursor of things more horrifying to come. You know, in the first part of chapter 2, I alluded to it. The locust horde foreshadows an invasion of a fierce army. Now, while Joel does not identify the army, this is likely the Assyrian invasion. And you think about then the locusts really just prefiguring these cruel and barbarous men coming to lay low the people of God with the edge of the sword, right? That's what the locusts are really in some ways signifying. You know what terrible desolation an army can bring. And then later on, when the Babylonians come, you think of them locust-like, right? You remember Jeremiah's tears, uh, Jerusalem laid low to the ground. Now, these are the kinds of things that God is signifying by this locust horde. Now, as we think on these things and what these things signify, you know, children, you have to ask this question, are these just a series of unfortunate coincidences? Right? When our nation sees um, calamity after calamity come, we just think, oh, wow, we're just, quote unquote, unlucky, or we're just in a bad season or a spell. Right? Is that what's going on? No, God is sovereign, isn't he, children? None of this is coincidence. In Amos 3.6, right? we've recently heard this, shall there be evil or calamity in a city and the Lord hath not done it. This is the Lord's doing. And we would be very spiritually insensitive if we were blind to it, right? These events were God's hands upon his people, and the question is why? Why? Well, it's their unfaithfulness, isn't it? It was a breach of the covenant that God had made. In fact, the very things that happened to them, and it's easy to miss, is that these are the things God promised would happen if they were unfaithful. Listen to, let's start with Deuteronomy 28, verses 33 and 34. This is before they come in. God says, uh, he threatens in this way, the fruit of thy land and all thy labors, 
right? The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. This is where the locusts come in. And thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway, so that thou shalt be mad. Children, that means go insane. For the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. Now I'll pause there. All of your labors gone because of your unfaithfulness. Uh, to the point where you will be driven insane. Now, isn't that how it feels when sin devours our substance right, and our soul and we look at the effects of it? Sometimes you feel like you're going mad, but there's more on that later. Verses 38 to 42 of Deuteronomy 28. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field and shalt gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine oil shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them. Why? For they shall go into captivity. All thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. You know, what was happening, if we were sensitive to it in Joel 1, is exactly what God had promised if they were unfaithful to him. In other words, this is God keeping his threat, isn't it? That he would send the locusts to deal with their gross unfaithfulness. In other words, and here's where I think we need to take heed, right? If they were spiritually sensitive, they wouldn't have even needed Joel's prophecy. Because God had already told them these things. They didn't even need the prophet to preach what he was preaching because it was plain in one of the first five books of the Bible that these things would happen. And if they were spiritually sensitive, they would see the locust horde. And instead of wondering, well, maybe the um, weather patterns are off right now, they would look in the book and say, this is because of our unfaithfulness. This is something we don't do, do we? You know, the problem is not really the scarcity here of crops, the problem in Joel's time was first and foremost was the scarcity of the word of the Lord. The Lord's word was not maintained. You know, you remember this, right? Uh, we were just here in family worship, so it's near and dear on my heart. Why Josiah tears his clothes when he hears the word of the Lord. Right? It, it's not just because the word of the Lord was, was finally, he had some books of the Bible he didn't have before, but when it was read to him, he heard that because of all that the people had done, judgment is coming. That's why he tears his clothes. He said, you know, even Josiah was in some way, it seems, oblivious to the great judgment that would come on God's people. He looked at all they had done against the Lord and they knew, and he knew that God was going to judge his people. And this is why God took that godly king at a young age, so that he wouldn't be driven mad, as in Deuteronomy 28, by looking at his nation in such a state as Jeremiah would see. But what really ought to have gotten their attention in the midst of the locust plague was to the spiritually sensitive, the most awful and horrifying famine of all. It was a famine of sacrifice. In Joel 1 verse 9, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord's ministers mourn. Now the spiritually sensitive, when they see the famine, right? What they see is even more heinous than, than that they don't have food on the table. Is that there is no more sacrifice being offered in the temple. And what an awful thing that is, right? The priests mourn, the Lord's ministers mourn. What a thing is it? Beloved, if sacrifice for sin was cut off from a land. Have you ever thought on that? That kind of thing can happen today, right? Though Christ has been our once and for all sacrifice. We don't sacrifice Christ like the Roman Catholics believe they do in the Mass. But what about the holding forth of his sacrifice? What about the holding forth of his sacrifice to the people? That may cease. Don't assume you will always have it. And what a blight that would be on a land if Christ were not freely offered in the gospel from the pulpits of that land. 
That would be a dreadful thing to us. Would it not? Have you never thought on that? Of a famine as Amos, you know, Joel's perhaps ministerial colleague uh, would have preached, right? A famine, a greater famine in the land, a famine of the word of God. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of what? Hearing the words of the Lord. And what do you hear in the words of the Lord? What you heard this morning, Christ held forth to you. And that is a terrible thing. That is a terrible judgment. When God then sends judgment on a place, the holding forth of the sacrifice of sin ceases. Even amongst his people, you know, in our denomination from coast to coast, should we not take notice when there are so many empty pulpits amongst us? Should we not take notice then in our, in our nation, going beyond our denomination, to how many pulpits where they might be saying something, but there is no holding forth of Christ to the people who hear? Should we not take notice and say the locusts have come? They're not coming. In a way, they're already here aren't they? There's a famine of the biblical gospel, salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. Instead of pulpits preaching, as we hear in our text, that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, there is deafening silence. And what is it? And really, it's not silence. It's chatter in a lot of places. Platitudes, moralism, comedy. But God's not laughing at these things. God is judging. This is a calamity. Whose fault is it? It's the church's fault for not being faithful to the word of God. It's our fault. It's our fault. And that's the Lord's hand of chastening. And, you know, we are so insensitive, we don't even think on these things. So we are, when we see calamity of this kind come upon us, and we look at it now, and maybe, you know, you can go to the stores and the store shelves are full, but we ought to be more pain, right? We'd sometimes, if the store shelves and people are crazy in, in weather like this, right? You know, the joke is always that milk and toilet paper are always disappearing from the shelves, right? And sometimes we go to the store and we're like, we need these things. Where are they? And maybe there's a little bit of panic. But how much panic is there when we see that very few churches are preaching the word of God? We ought to be very panicked. And that number is not necessarily increasing, is it, in our land? That number is decreasing. And we ought to be very panicked. And when calamity of this sort comes upon us, God calls us to search our ways. It's always astonishing to see temporal chastisements upon God's people go unheeded, whether individually on us, individually in denominations or in presbyteries or congregations like ours. You know, one time I dealt with a man who was caught in notorious sin, and I had been pleading with him and other elders too. He's not a member of this congregation, so don't don't have to think about our brethren here. We had many of us warned him to turn away from his sin, and then he gets into a terrible car accident, and he reached out to me, and I said, do you not think that God is trying to get a hold of you in this thing? Do you just think that this thing happened, as the pagans say, as an accident? There's no coincident here. Repent, I said, lest some worse thing come upon you. Now, thankfully, months later, the man did. He didn't immediately, but he did repent. Praise God. But we are to take note of these things when we are in high-handed sin. That said, calamity and desolation may not be due to our own individual sin. It may even be the sin of another that has affected us, or the sin of a church, or the sin of a nation. You think of many here in Joel's time. They were faithful. Joel himself was. Jeremiah would be later. So would Daniel and his friends. But the sins of the church universal comes upon us as well. And we're caught up in it as God's people. We can never, and this would be so schismatic, brethren, we can never say that the Dallas RP is divorced from the universal church and that the sins of the universal church do not affect us and our sins do not affect the universal church. We are part and parcel of the same body of Christ. The sins of the church universal will affect us as we are part of it, regardless of denomination. But with all that, I know I've gone a little long in some of this context, but I think there's some pastorally helpful things there. What I want you to hear and take note of is this. Sin is a devourer. Sin is a devourer. 
If you can take that much from this head, you will do well. You know, you think about how sin is portrayed in the word of God. In Joel, the effect of sin is like a locust horde, isn't it? It's a famine that comes along with it. A famine comes and we're parched and empty. It's like a vicious army as well in Joel that burns a nation to the ground, pillaging, murdering, and raping. Yes, that's what sin does to a soul. Pillages, murders, rapes. In the New Testament, the effect of sin is like leprosy and the slow, unclean death that comes with it. But even as I've talked about other chastisements and plagues, what happens to us? We are more horrified of locusts and leprosy than of sin. And that ought never be. Sin is far worse, and the effect on your soul is quite deadly. Sin is children. Sin is a devourer. It will devour your soul. It will waste you. It will bring a famine to you and your life. And if you can meditate on sin as a locust horde and as leprosy and do that every day of your life, you will do well by God's grace. He will keep you from it. Well, in our text, when the chastisement came of the locust plague and famine and armies, what was the Lord's prescription? Well, it was quite gracious, though our flesh hates it. It was repentance. Verses 12 to 14. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. Why? Why turn unto the Lord our God? For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? The Lord wants your heart broken over your sin, brethren. When you are caught in it, he says in Psalm 51 that the sacrifice that he will not despise is a broken and a contrite heart, doesn't he? He wants you to turn unto him with all your heart in repentance, right? Think of it this way, children. If sin is a departure from God to idolatry and uncleanness and everything else, what is repentance but a turning back to the Lord your God and a turning away from your sin? And it is the grace of God when you do it. Repentance is the grace of God. And so you all must, I don't know where you are individually, but you all must leave sin behind. It devours your years. It is time gone. It is time wasted. It is a spiritual famine you have indulged in. You have been eating dirt and dust and not the good things of the Lord. And your soul withers away and and you are useless to both God and man. So believer, you need to ask yourself this, or God is asking this rather through the ministry now. Is this a season where you are backslidden in sin? Are you even sensible to what it has done to you or is doing to you that it devours you like a locust horde? It chews and gnaws and gnaws away at your soul bit by bit, wave after wave after wave until there's nothing left. And soon... You find, as in Joel 1, there is no sacrifice of praise to give unto God in your soul, and you are unfruitful. All your labors wasted. Has it been a while since you have been constant with the Lord, walking with Him in faith and repentance and obedience? Are you feeling lukewarm? Are you weary of God? Is it the world that calls out to you, As a siren, plenty of time for YouTube and Facebook, perhaps, but no time for the Lord. More attractive than Christ is presently to you? Is there some secret sin that you are cherishing and nurturing, treating like a pet in your heart, that you're growing? Well, what is that? That's like locust larvae planted all throughout your soul that one day is about to burst forth and devour you at the appointed time. You put all that away. Is it not time for you to return unto God? Is it not time for each of you to return unto God and away from your sin? Even if it has been decades of sin, it is time to turn unto the Lord your God. You heard him himself. 
It is time to turn, for he is gracious and he is merciful. Does he not induce you to come? Does he not say, I am gracious? Does he not say, I am merciful? Will you not turn unto me? And maybe, and you know how often this afflicts many, and I can't say I've been unaffected by it myself. Maybe you say, but I have wasted so much time, and I have given away like the prodigal so much of my substance and the inheritance that God has given me. And you say, can I turn? I've wasted my vitality even. So what's the point of walking with God today when so much time is lost and time seems running out? You know, this kind of regret over time lost and not redeemed has been a great impediment to the reformation and restoration even of God's people. It's true. That's why God speaks this word to us in Joel 2. This often stymies us. You know, some later in life, I've actually heard this. I am too old to walk with the Lord. Seventy years I have spent in sin. What point is there in spending the fleeting moments I have left with Jesus Christ? Brethren, let me, let me put it this way. As we know in the Bible, the devil is a master manipulator. And we are told not to be unaware of his devices or his schemes or his machinations. What does he do? And isn't it so remarkable? First thing he does to you is this. He tempts you to spend all of your time in sin. Right? He says, spend time, indulge time in this sin. And why spend a little time? Spend a lot of time. These things will make you happy. And then when the Lord, when he finds in horror, to his horror, the Lord has convicted you of your sin and you're moving to the Lord in repentance, what is the next thing he tempts you with? Well, you've spent all your time in sin. What use can you be to God with the time that you have left? It's quite remarkable, isn't it, how he does these things. You've spent all this time, you wicked person, though he tempted you to do these things. And then he will keep you from the Lord in this other temptation to despair. Right? Hopelessness then begins and you lose track of what God calls you to be and to do. The devil is a master manipulator and we fall for it far, far too often, brethren. But in verse 21, with all these fears before us, what does the Lord say? Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. He says, fear not. Don't fear anything that would keep you from coming to me. Whether it is anything in your soul, whether it is anything physical between you and the Lord, whether it is um, difficulty or trial or men or armies, he says, fear not. But come to me. Be glad and rejoice in me. You know, children, maybe you can look at this the Sabbath day. How often in the New Testament does Jesus say, fear not? When he's there, fear not. How often does he say, it is I, be not afraid? Now, all these fears we're called to put away. All these fears were to put away in view of our Lord. He says, repent to me, put your fears away, whatever they are, I will fully and totally receive you. You heard of repentance this way on Wednesday night, didn't you? In Luke 15, 21, when the prodigal was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Fear not. There will be a great restoration of your relationship with the Lord, your God. Fear not. Repent of your sin to the Lord who will have great compassion upon you for turning to him. Do not be ashamed. There is no shame to those who are in the Lord. He says twice in our text, I'll get to it later, that there is no shame for the people of God. But you ask still, what of my wasted years? What of the time I had spent apart from the Lord, the years of sin? Well, that's where we have to take up the glory of verse 25, don't we? which we'll consider in our next heading, which is restoration and rejoicing. So sin devours our years. And the few years we have can seem wasted totally away, and we can regret these things. And I'll just be a little personal for you right now. I'm, I'm keenly aware of these things myself, personally. You know, many of you know I was converted when I was 30 years old. You know, 30 years old. Um, 
So that means at this time, being 45, I've only been born again 15 years. And so I look on my life and I say, two-thirds, Lord, two-thirds spent in sin and away from my God. You know, I've only been in the ministry now three years. I'm middle-aged now. While many of my ministerial colleagues, you know, who grew up with the Lord, you know, they've been, they, uh, if they're my age, they're maybe 20 years in the ministry, right? Three years, 20 years. And it's easy to say, look at how those years have been so wasted in sin. While my friends have been so fruitful for the Lord, I had nothing to give but blasphemy and persecution and indolence and uncleanness. While they were offering up sacrifices of praise to God and even leading people to him. And that can be something that weighs quite heavy on a soul. Right? How many years do I truly have left for God in this life? Why can I, could I not have known the Lord sooner in my life and served him sooner? But we do have to take heart, right? Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. That's Acts 15. He decrees the end from the beginning. And he knows exactly what he's doing in our lives. And we have to be content in that. That said, before I return to that, Boys and girls, I feel especially that I have to exhort you in a time like this, right? Make the most of your time with the Lord today in your youth. You know, one of the things about Timothy, right? You think about Paul, which I'll get to a little later. Say Paul was converted about 30 years old himself, but he writes to a young minister named Timothy who says, and he says to this man, let no one despise your youth. Like here's a man who had been with the Lord longer, you know, as far as time when he started with the Lord than Paul was. But what a glorious thing it is that Paul could say to Timothy that he had known the scriptures from his youth, right? He had known Christ for so long, in other words. And so make the most of your days like Timothy did, such that, and think of this, children, that by the time you're my age, you will have had 45 years with the Lord. Well, I have only had 15, right? And you think about this, you will probably have more years with the Lord, right? By the time you're my age, than I have years with the Lord remaining. Being that the average life expectancy for an American male is about 73 years of age. So that said, be with the Lord at an early age. But for those of you here who, like me, keenly feel the loss of years apart from Jesus. Listen to God's gracious promise in verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worms, uh, my great army which I sent among you. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. Now in the Hebrew language, you can also, maybe this would be helpful, the word restore can be uh, translated as repay, repay. In other words, this is a word of grace to the chief of sinners, that he will graciously repay to you all the years that sin has stolen from you. Your own sin, mind you, your own sin against him. He will repay those years to you. What has been destroyed through sin and covenant unfaithfulness, God is saying, as it were, I will give you abundantly more and restore to you. It is as if sin had not devoured, as if destruction did not come. Now let's just stop. Is that not a great and gracious promise from the Lord our God? Isn't that a precious thing designed to have us seek the Lord and to pursue him, to repent and put away our regret and to walk with the Lord in fruitful faithfulness? But what does he mean that he will restore the years that the locust had eaten? eaten? Will he add the years that were wasted to your life? In other words, will he add 30 years to my own life? No, probably not. I don't expect to live an extra 30 years to be 103 or something like that. Now, what the Lord promises is so evident to see through 
scriptural examples. For those who repent and turn to him, he can make them exceedingly fruitful with the years that they have. Abundantly fruitful. Because it is God who works in us to accomplish his good pleasure. He is the source of our fruitfulness. We are not the source ourselves. And that is the great blessing, right? And that's what I I opened with this thought. Maybe we need to think on it again. Can he not accomplish in a day what men think takes billions of years? Children, men disbelieve that God created the universe in six days and all that is in them, all that is in the world and everything else. Unbelievers say billions of years were required for all of this. Hardly. So you ask the question, what can the God who created all things out of nothing in the space of six days do with a nothing like myself in the space of six days? He can do extraordinary things, couldn't he? Isn't that how he can keep this promise? He can transform the years that are left into years of exceeding fruitfulness. And that is how he repays what sin is has devoured. Like Job, your latter years can be more greatly blessed than the former years. Consider, I'll just give you two examples from the Bible. There are more. But Moses, right, when he was 80 years old, two-thirds of his life had gone. Did the Lord not more greatly bless the last 40 years of Moses' life over his first 80? Absolutely so. What of Paul? For about 30 years, he lived apart from Christ. He said of himself before Christ met him, who was before, speaking of himself, a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. 1 Timothy 1.13, autobiographical. He breathed out what? Threatenings and slaughter against the church in Acts 9 verse 1. Is this not a terrible and wicked life that the man lived before Christ knocked him down and then lifted him back up? What of his latter days? What of his latter days? Were they not extraordinarily fruitful? How much of our New Testament has come through the Holy Spirit's work in that man's latter life? Sending us the clearest expositions of the doctrine of grace and glory to come. His heart was turned aflame to Jesus. He lived as a debtor to mercy The life that he lived was in view of Christ's sacrifice for him. And what? He even went to the ends of the earth at the time, planting churches in the time that he had left. How much greater was his fruitfulness than the years sin had devoured by God's grace? Did the Lord not restore to him? Was he not true to this pledge to restore to him the years that sin had devoured? Absolutely so. Jesus gave him a promise. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. And you have insight, don't you, into the apostle's own frame of mind and heart and how he lived in view of his past. He did not forget his past completely, did he? It was there, pressing in the epistle. In Philippians, he knows it. He knows what he had been. He knows what he had done. But how does he live his life? In view of promises like, I will restore you to, the, to you the years the locust had eaten. Philippians 3, 13-15. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. What? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be what? Thus minded. Let us have this mind. And if anything be, uh, anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Well, here, God is revealing this to you. Be thus minded. Forget what is behind and reach forth to what is before you. Reach forth to what? Or to whom? Christ. What do you do with your regret then? We have to know what to do with it. You bring your regret to Christ in repentance. You have a broken heart and you repent over your sin and you acknowledge to the Lord, look 
at the desolation that my own sin has caused in my life. But then you turn it to him. You leave it with him. And you express the regret of the wasted years in that. Then what? Just like we heard with the prodigal, you arise. You arise from your knees. You leave your regret and you are filled by the Holy Spirit with hope and anticipation, reaching forth to Christ before you. A life now and a life now lived for the glory of God. You say what is done is done, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right? Christ is dealing with my shame and my regret. What is done is done. And Jesus Christ, by faith we believe, can redeem the years. The locusts of my sin has chewed away. What you are to do is, you you remember, here's another example, children, you might know. King Manasseh, when he is convicted of his sin, he gets up out uh, out of captivity. He runs back to Judah and he slaughters all the idols that he had raised up. And his latter end was so much more fruitful than the evil that he had done in the past. And like Manasseh, by God's spirit, what you do is you get up with godly fervency and you smash every idol that is remaining in your heart. As Manasseh removed from the temple of God those idols he himself erected, you remove what you have erected in the temple of God, which is your own heart. And he will make that incredibly fruitful. And it's not just even our own sin, as I mentioned before. This has to do with whatever situation you find yourself in. When there seems to be setbacks in life, when there are disappointments, often this comes from sin as well, sins of others perhaps, or maybe it just doesn't seem like your labors for the Lord are fruitful. Think of the faithful caught up in the famine of Judah. Surely what disappointment there was. All my labor gone. It seems like my years are wasted. And I wasn't one who erected idols. And so perhaps you feel like your labor for the Lord has come to naught or there have been setbacks in your life and maybe you've searched your heart and these are not your own personal sin. But first of all, what the Bible promises and you must believe is that your labors for the Lord are never in vain. Never in vain. You know that the Lord often hides fruit from us and will reveal it in glory so that we will not boast today. Even so, do not lose hope that your latter years may be more fruitful than what sin has devoured. If you perceive things have gone upside down in your life, don't grow despondent. Don't grow discouraged. Do not be faithless, but believing as the Lord would tell you even if it is somebody else's sin that is the reason for the predicament you seem to be in, God can restore what sin has robbed from you. Maybe you have spent years in slothful and unspiritual living as a Christian. You did not redeem the time and your years were chewed away. and You've been lukewarm for far too long. What does the Lord say to you? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be zealous. Come to me. Repent and see if I will not make your latter years more fruitful. He can restore what your sloth has eaten away. He can and will replace famine with feasting, brethren. You know, the Lord often reverses situations so dramatically that it astonishes us. Verse 19, Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. Verse 24, And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now, time almost gone. What is the feasting here? Foremost, for us looking at these things with spiritual eyes, this is a feasting on Christ by faith, isn't it? In view of repentance, Acts 13, 19, and 20 promise that times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ. 
He shall send Christ to you and he will be marrow and fatness for your soul. You remember who Paul was striving for when he reached forth. It was Jesus Christ. You know, when he was in prison cells, he had spiritual meat others had no clue about who were in jail right next to him. And he was full and satisfied there spiritually. Refreshment then, even in a prison cell, though sin had snatched his early years from him. Above all, Christ will give you the blessing of communion with him when you seek him. Right, that is the best part of all of a life, however short it is lived. That is the most fruitful thing of all is to be in communion with the Lord, isn't it? When you reach forward forward to him as Paul was, and you even touch the hem of his garment, what comes next? Joy. And you say, What are the decades that the locusts had chewed away compared to a single moment at the feet of my Savior? Truly, this is the better portion. And this is where true and lasting joy comes from, brethren. You know, anytime you turn to the Lord, you have occasion for great joy. Verses 26 and 27. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed oh bless the Lord my soul that the Lord is in our midst in view of that what does he say all the regret all the shame and the shamefacedness we ought to have he says twice my people shall never be ashamed and you say in view of all my sin what in the world what is this word from god in view of all my shame and the shamefacedness i deserve what kind of god is this i desire i deserve shame I des- uh, the des- devouring locusts are mine to own. I deserve ruin and rubble. I confess with Daniel, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces or shame of face. But because of Jesus Christ and faith in him, my shame is gone and I am given his righteousness. On the cross, right? It was he who took away my shame. And as you heard this morning, he made it his own. He was made a byword. He was shamed in front of God and man on my behalf so that he could say to me in this word, my people will never be ashamed because I was shamed in their place. Brethren, Do not let shame over sin repented of keep you from moving forward. Do not let the remorse you often feel in this life of waste keep you from the one thing that is needful and choosing the better portion to be with Christ. What shame is there for the one who is with Christ after all? If Christ is not ashamed to be called our brethren, what shame is there for the people of God? He will restore the years the locusts have chewed away, even if you only have in God's decree a single, solitary year of your life. Oh, what a year that could be. What a year that could be. A year full of communion with the Lord, full of faith, hope, and love. What sin takes away, the Lord can replace more than a thousandfold, can he not? And really, at the end of the day, what are the years you and I feel were wasted in sin and desolate. In view of eternity, the former years are a vapor, aren't they? They're a breeze, comes and goes. He reminds you, doesn't he, that even if the afflictions in this time are brief and momentary, light and momentary, they are so in view of the eternal weight of glory to come. Eternity is a long time. Whatever your sin has done to you will be completely overshadowed in eternity, brethren. Whatever, uh, can you imagine it, right? 
when you have been in the presence of the Lamb for a trillion years, you still have ahead of you an infinite number of years more than that. And then when you look back at a life, even seven decades of sin that was wasted before even your repentance came, what will you say to 70 years in view of trillions and trillions and trillions of years? Surely he is going to restore the years that the locusts had chewed away and more than that as well. So shall we lose hope? No. Shall we now not walk with him? Yes. One caution before the end. Let us never use this gracious promise to live in sin. Saying, I will enjoy sin for now because God will bless my latter days. That is presumption. And that is presumption from a wicked heart of unbelief. And we are to repent of that thought, lest you be proven a castaway. Because the believer is actually mortified by such a thought as that. Shall we sin so that grace may abound and all that? So in view of that, let me just address those of you who are here outside of Christ. You know, sin will be your ruin unless it is repented of. You might say, well, I am out of Christ and I feel quite well. I don't feel this devouring you've been preaching on and on and on about. You know, if you've been with us in our public witness, we run into that all the time. Uh, people are ins insensible to their sin and what sin has done. In such a neighborhood as this, as you've gone door to door, in fact, you go to the doors and people say, I don't need Christ. I'm doing well enough on my own, right? Well, see, this is part of the great problem of how sin has devoured us. It has made us spiritually deadened. If you want to look at the leper, for instance, one of his great problems is that the leprosy removes from him a sense of pain, such that if he stubbed his toe, he doesn't feel it, and his bones collapse, and he doesn't realize it. And now he's going to die of an infection he didn't realize that he has. And that's the problem with the sinner outside of Christ, totally insensitive to the fact that they're being eaten alive by their sin and they don't feel it. And that's you, unbeliever. Naturally, your spiritual nerves are dead and you don't realize sin is devouring your soul. So if you are here and you are unbelieving, may this be the day that the Lord by his Holy Spirit grabs a hold of you and turns your spiritual nervous system on so that you might sense what sin has done. Only God can wake you up. And may God wake you up to this. Because, you know, the Lord intends for you to be shaken in some sense by this text. Because the book of Joel points us beyond locusts and beyond armies invading to a great and dreadful day called the day of the Lord. In Joel 2 verse 1, For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. There's a day of judgment coming for us all. And that's going to make locusts and armies look like nothing. You know, if you truly could apprehend the day of the Lord, you would say something like this. Let the locusts come instead. Let the mountains fall on my head. Let Hamas invade my city. But keep the wrath of the Lamb far, far from me. For who can stand when his wrath has come? Yet he shows you grace. The gospel hasn't been silenced in this place. The sacrifice is held forth. He shows you grace today, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And you heard that this morning, how the apostle took that verse in the New Testament. That is the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Take it and be saved. <sighs> if we had more time, you'd see the prophecy of Pentecost here at the end. And I would just ask you, believer, did the Spirit not get poured out at Pentecost? Yes. That promise was fulfilled. So do you think that this promise in Joel 2.25 will go unfulfilled in Christ? No. So let us leave here with a sense of hope and joy in the Lord. Reach forward to the things that are ahead and put behind you the things that are before. And that's a fitting meditation for the new year, isn't it? If your past year has been full of sin, and chewed away this year and all the years ahead of you, however long they may be, may be years filled with fruitfulness. And maybe you need to hear that at the beginning of the year of our Lord 2024. 
and uh, that the Lord may put the locust behind you, that with purpose of heart you might cleave to the Lord. May God help us reach forth to Christ, and may we bless him for his word. Amen. Let us arise for prayer, if able. O Lord our God, may, may thou be glorified in the word that thou hast given us. We do not deserve such a gracious God, and yet thou art gracious. Bless us. Uh, turn the sinner here who is apart from Christ to the Lord Jesus. May they trust in him, and may the remainder of their life as they turn unto the Lord and they call on him be so fruitful that there may be apostle, men of the sort of Apostle Paul in our midst. Um, women who would be like Hannah, so desirous of the Lord to spend and be spent for him, even in the raising up of children to dedicate to the Lord if they be called to motherhood. Uh, we know that thou, because thou art great and can do what is impossible for man, can do great things with our lives. Oh, would you give us the heart to pursue thee and to forget what is behind that we may reach forth unto Christ and may Christ who alone can do such great and marvelous things receive the glory and praise for we ask in Jesus name. Amen. Let us respond with praise to God from Psalm 30 verses 8 through 12. We'll just conclude singing where we left off this morning. And uh, as we think on the sermon text, verse 11 and 12, Thou turned hast my sadness to dancing, yea, my sackcloth loosed, think of the sackcloth in repentance, and girded me with gladness, that sing thy praise my glory may and never silent be. O Lord my God, forevermore I will give thanks to thee. Let us sing verses 8 through 12 to the tune of Norwich. La, la, la. 